He had a good handle, great footwork, and was one of the best operators from the triple threat. He could give it to you however you wanted, whether that meant going to work in the post, slashing to the hoop, or pulling up in the mid-range. Jamal Mashburn had a complete offensive game, but with all his offensive talents came some ill-advised shot attempts that wouldn't always drop. But with Mash, it was always a possibility. His defense could leave something to be desired at times, but more than anything, he wasn't able to reach his full potential because his knees gave out on him relatively early in his career, which was tough to see, as his time spent on the court showed that he was an elite NBA talent when healthy. He wasn't the biggest or the fastest, but he had a quick first step and a skill set that allowed for him to exploit some matchups. He was a top 5 scorer in the league by his second season and prematurely left the league still as a 20 point per game guy. He was most entertaining when he had more free reign like he did in Dallas or with the Hornets, but he was also an integral system player during his time spent with those great Heat teams of the late 90s. But regardless of how he was contributing, you made sure you were watching, because Monster Mash could put on an offensive masterclass against anybody. But unfortunately, injuries stole so much great basketball from him, and with only one all-star selection to his name, he can fall through the cracks when talking about the great scores of that era. So today, we're going to shine some light and jog your memory on Jamal Mashburn. Jamal Mashburn attended Cardinal Hayes High School in the Bronx, where in his senior season he would average 26.3 points, 10.5 rebounds, and 4.3 assists per game, while leading his team to a Catholic high school championship. The team would challenge for the state championship, but lost to eventual champion Grady High in the semifinals in a game where Mashburn finished with 22 points and 9 rebounds. And for his efforts, Mashburn would be named Mr. New York Basketball for 1990. Mashburn would choose to attend the University of Kentucky, which was a somewhat baffling choice, as due to an investigation in the late 80s, which discovered that Kentucky had been paying recruits to sign with them, as well as Eric Manuel being banned from competition due to receiving improper assistance on his college entry exam, the school was placed on a three-year probation from the 89 season through the 91 season, which included a two-year ban from tournament play. While this was deterring a lot of potential recruits from choosing Kentucky, Mashburn saw this as an opportunity, and would say on the Knuckleheads podcast, that his main priority was making it to the NBA, and going to Kentucky would guarantee him an opportunity to secure early playing time, and showcase his skills. And a 91 interview saw him say that the lack of live televised games helps take some of the pressure off of him. Mashburn would be a freshman in the 91 season under coach Rick Pitino, where Mashburn would play and start in 28 games, and finish third on the team in scoring. The Wildcats would finish 22-6 in a season that included Mashburn dropping a Kentucky freshman record 31 points versus Georgia, as well as two player of the games versus Mississippi State and Vanderbilt. The Wildcats would not see tournament play as this was the final year of their ban, but for Mashburn, this season saw him finish with averages of about 13 points, 7 rebounds, and 1.5 and assists per game, which earned him a third team All-SEC selection. Kentucky had new life going into the 1992 season as they were no longer on probation. Even though Mashburn was the only future NBA talent on the team, Kentucky had a great season. However, that's not to say that they had no one else on the team as Kentucky had a group of very capable seniors who along with Mashburn became the unforgettables. Kentucky had one of the most memorable seasons in NCAA history as the team went 29-7 which included an SEC title where Mashburn scored 28 points. In Kentucky's first tournament appearance since 1988, they would beat Old Dominion, Iowa State, and UMass before getting an Elite 8 matchup versus Christian Leitner and Duke. This game has been dubbed by some as the greatest college game ever played, where Mashburn put up 28 points and 10 rebounds on nearly 69% shooting to lead an underdog Kentucky team that took the Blue Devils to overtime and appeared to have the game locked up when Sean Woods hit a runner to put Kentucky up by one with 2.1 seconds left. But then Leitner would hit a turnaround fadeaway at the buzzer to win the game on what is now simply known as the shot. And that would be the end of Kentucky's year, but Mashburn as the team's leading scorer finished with averages of about 21.5 points, 8 rebounds, and 1.5 and assists per game. And he would do this on almost 57% from the field and almost 44% from three, en route to a first team all SEC selection. Mashburn would also earn a spot on the 92 US Select team, who would famously scrimmage and beat the 92 US Dream Team in an experience that Mashburn would reflect on fondly on the Knuckleheads podcast. 1993 would be Mashburn's final season as a Wildcat. He didn't disappoint as he once again led the team in scoring and was the only player to average over 14 points and one of just two players to average double figures. Mashburn was a consistent, reliable scorer this year as he dropped at least 20 in 21 of a possible 34 games, including a 38 point, 19 rebound performance versus Eastern Kentucky. Mashburn again led Kentucky to an SEC title in which he scored 17 versus LSU. And Kentucky had a phenomenal tournament run 
as they made it all the way to the Final Four, where they would face Michigan in the Fab Five. Mashburn saved his best game of the tournament for Michigan, as he scored 26 points on over 55% shooting, but with 323 left in a close overtime game, Mashburn fouled out, and Michigan went on to beat Kentucky 81-78. It was a heartbreaking end of the season, but Mashburn had done what he came to do at Kentucky, and that was make his case as a top NBA prospect. And he added to that case by averaging about 21 points, 8.5 rebounds, and 3.5 assists per game, while being named first team All-SEC, SEC Player of the Year, and a consensus first team All-American. Mashburn would enter the 1993 NBA Draft, where he'd be selected by the Dallas Mavericks fourth overall. Mashburn would also say on the Knuckleheads podcast that he felt he could possibly go to Orlando, but when Orlando made the Penny Hardaway for Chris Webber trade with Golden State, it led to Mashburn going to Dallas. Mashburn would show his kind heart prior to his rookie season as he donated half a million dollars to his alma mater and did this before he had even signed his first NBA contract, but was still able to afford this because of a five-year, $5 million deal he had signed with Fila. The Mavericks were coming off a horrible 93 season that saw them finish 11-71. and However, the team did have a bright spot in their now second-year guard Jim Jackson, who had only played in 28 games for the Mavs during his rookie season due to a contract dispute. But now, the Mavs had Jamal Mashburn to pair with Jim Jackson, alongside franchise legend Derek Harper at point guard. But Harper would play just 28 games for the Mavs before being traded to the Knicks mid-season, leaving Mashburn and Jackson to lead the team. And although Jackson and Mashburn each averaged over 19 points per game, the next leading scorer after Harper had left was Sean Rooks, and he only played in 47 games this year. So the Mavs finished 13-69, and but Mashburn would lead all rookies in scoring including a 37-point game versus Houston and Charlotte. Mashburn's efforts would earn him a first-team all-rookie selection. The Mavs' terrible finish got them the second pick in the draft, where they would select Jason Kidd out of Cal. So now the Mavs had a 24-year-old Jim Jackson, a 22-year-old Jamal Mashburn, and a 21-year-old Jason Kidd manning the offense. And this trio would become known as the Three Jays. The Three Jays were the three leading scorers of the team, with Jackson and Mashburn both averaging over 24 points. They also had an honorary 4th J in Popeye Jones, doing the dirty work and averaging a double-double. The team missed the playoffs, but improved by 23 games from the season prior, as they finished 36-46. and The season also included Mashburn scoring a career-high 50 points against Scottie Pippen and the Bulls in a November 12th win. The team may have challenged for a playoff spot as well, if Jackson wouldn't have missed 31 games over the course of the season. And even though Jackson had a higher scoring average than Mashburn, he didn't play in the required 58 games to be eligible for the scoring leaderboards, so Mashburn's 24.1 points per game became a top 5 scoring average in the league. And to go along with this, he added about 4 rebounds and 3.5 assists. So 1996 was looking like the year for Dallas to get over the hump and break into winning basketball for the first time in 7 years. But this season would not go to plan at all. The three Jays and Popeye Jones played great for the Mavs, as they all averaged double digits. Jones averaged another double-double and Kidd nearly averaged a double-double. George McLeod also had his finest season as a pro by far. Mashburn had a great start to the year, averaging over 23 points per game, but unfortunately, he went down with a knee injury in mid-December, which eventually required surgery and would keep him out for the season after he played just 18 games. This season was also marred by conflict between Jason Kidd and Jim Jackson, as the two couldn't find a way to coexist on the team and both wanted to be the team's undisputed leader. I know the more popular rumor is that a love triangle involving Kidd, Jackson, and singer Tony Braxton drove them apart. And I don't have an opinion on this either way, but Mashburn would say in 2015 that as far as he was aware, she didn't play a part in the rift between Kidd and Jackson, at least the way the media tried to say that she did, if she played any part at all. Mashburn would also say on the Knuckleheads podcast in 2021 that their split up had nothing to do with Tony Braxton conflict, but he wouldn't go into any more detail. One highlight of the Mavs season was the team setting a league record for threes made and threes attempted in a single season. And Mashburn's short regular season saw him average about 23.5 points, 5.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. Mashburn's head coach for the first three seasons of his career, Dick Mata, was relieved of his head coaching duties prior to the 97 season. Mata was replaced with former Bulls assistant Jim Clemens, and the team ended up finishing 24-58. But this is understandable, as after starting the season with all three Jays, the Mavs ended the season with no Jays. Kidd would be the first to go, as he was traded to the Suns in December, as he had made it clear that it was either him or Jackson, and the Mavs had to choose. So it appeared that they chose Jackson. But in mid-February, the Mavs sent Jackson to the Nets. And in between these two trades, just a couple days before the Jackson trade, 
Mashburn was traded to Miami after 37 games with Dallas. A big reason for this trade being that Miami knew they were a contender and didn't want to miss their window after injuries to Dan Marley limited him to just 36 regular season games. Mashburn would later reveal on the Knuckleheads podcast that he had actually requested a trade out of Dallas as well, as he did not like Clemens' offense. Clemens employed the triangle offense that was so successful during his time in Chicago, but Mashburn would say that the triangle offense isn't for everybody. Mashburn would play 32 games and slot in nicely as a third option behind Tim Hardaway and Alonzo Mourning for a 61-21 Heat team who would go to the playoffs for the first time in Mashburn's career. Mashburn would average about 10 points on 38% shooting in a first round series win versus Orlando. He would however shoot over 44% from three. The second round would be the first of many brutal playoff matchups between Miami and New York in the late 90s. Mashburn would start in all seven games of the second round series win, but saw even lower contributions in the first round as he averaged under nine points per game and shot just over 36% from the field. The Eastern Conference Finals versus the defending champion Bulls ended in the Heat getting gentlemen swept, but this would be Mashburn's best series of the postseason, as he averaged nearly 13 points and almost 42% shooting, including a 17-point performance in the Heat's Game 4 win and 22 points in Game 5. And for the regular season, Mashburn put up overall averages of about 12 points, 4.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. 1998 was a similar regular season for the Heat overall, as they finished 55-27, and 27, to again make the playoffs and face the Knicks. However, Mashburn only played 48 games, as on February 13th, he fractured his thumb in a game against the Pistons, which would require surgery, and ended up keeping him out for the remainder of the season. Prior to the injury, Mashburn had been playing great for the Heat, as he had upped his scoring average from the year before, and was third on the team in scoring, and had his second highest field goal percentage of his career. The 55 wins by the Heat this season is quite impressive, considering along with Mashburn, Morning missed 23 games with injuries, including a late season fractured cheekbone. So the playoffs saw round two of the Heat-Knicks rivalry in round one of the playoffs. Mashburn would return for the series, but after so much time away from basketball, he couldn't get anything going, as he averaged just about six points on under 24% shooting. The Heat would lose in five games, but were also missing Alonzo Mourning for the series deciding game five, after he and Larry Johnson were suspended for a game four fight. But for the regular season, Mashburn averaged about 15 points, five rebounds, and three assists per game. The lockout shortened 99 season was even shorter for Mashburn, as injuries limited him to just 24 games. Mashburn would still be the Heat's third leading scorer behind Morning and Hardaway, and the Heat would finish with the best record in the East at 33 and 17. And for the third year in a row, the Heat would meet the Knicks in the playoffs, and would become the first victim of the eighth seeded Knicks Cinderella run to the finals, becoming just the second one seed to lose to an eight seed at the time, as Allen Houston hit a game winner with less than a second left in game five to win the series for New York. Mashburn had a more respectable series compared to the year before, but still didn't play great, although he would shoot nearly 43% from three, which was a postseason career high. And for the regular season, Mashburn averaged about 15 points, six rebounds, and three assists per game, on a career high 45.1% from the field. The 2000 Heat were aging, and Tim Hardaway specifically was starting to break down, as he played in just 52 games and had the lowest scoring average of his career up to that point. Mashburn was a bright spot for the Heat as he played in 76 games, which was his highest total since 1995, and he'd translate that availability to second on the team in scoring while shooting nearly 45% from the field and over 40% from three. The Heat were once again a playoff team after putting up 52 wins on the year and advanced past the first round for the first time in three years after sweeping the Pistons in a great series from Mashburn that saw him average 21, 5, and 5 on great shooting. But round two brought a familiar foe in the New York Knicks, and for the third year in a row, the Heat were bounced from the postseason by New York. Mashburn just couldn't seem to figure it out versus the Knicks, as his averages dropped across the board in the seven-game series. But this was an incredibly close series, as every game was decided by eight points or less. Additionally, even though Hardaway started and played all seven games, he was hobbled by a foot injury and was nowhere near his usual self. But for the regular season, Mashburn averaged about 17.5 points, five rebounds, and four assists per game. The Heat needed a change going into the 0-1 season, and the Charlotte Hornets were aware that their star swingman Eddie Jones was likely going to leave for Miami in free agency. So the Heat and Hornets orchestrated a sign-in trade that saw the Heat get Jones and Anthony Mason, while Charlotte received Mashburn and P.J. Brown. The 0-1 season saw Mashburn play 76 games for the second straight season and have his best season since his Dallas years, 
as he averaged 20 points per game for the first time since 96 and formed a scoring trio with Baron Davis and David Wesley that combined for over 50 points per game. A healthy Mashburn led the Hornets to a 46-36 and record and a playoff appearance. This would be the best postseason of Mashburn's career by far, as round one saw him matched up with his former team in the Miami Heat, and the Hornets would sweep the Heat with Mashburn leading the charge, averaging almost 24 points per game on 44% from the field and 66% from three. The Hornets would meet the Bucks and their trio of Glenn Robinson, Ray Allen, and Sam Gassell in the second round. Robinson and Mashburn would have an entertaining seven-game battle that saw Mashburn be the series' leading scorer at over 25 points per game, including a playoff career high of 36 in a Game 3 win. But it wouldn't be enough, as the Bucks outlasted the Hornets to advance to the Eastern Conference Finals. But Mashburn had finally gotten the playoff monkey off his back with this performance. And for the regular season, Mashburn averaged about 20 points, a career-high 7.6 rebounds, and about 5.5 assists per game. The 0-2 season saw Baron Davis take a big step in his game, and the trio of Mashburn, Davis, and Wesley averaged over 53 a game. But Mashburn would play less than half the season, as he was only able to suit up for 40 games, as he dealt with an abdominal injury for a lot of the season. But the Hornets would still go 44-38 and and make the playoffs, where they would beat the Magic in Round 1, before losing to the Nets in 5 games in Round 2. In a postseason that saw Mashburn log just 10 total minutes, as after Game 1 versus Orlando, Mashburn would be hospitalized twice over the next two games with some sort of illness that would eventually become an unexpected diagnosis of positional vertigo from non-team doctors. But Mashburn probably didn't choose the best course of action after the diagnosis as he opted to stay home and watch the game instead of joining the team and supporting from the bench. And his teammates seemed to understand his reasoning, but at the same time would have preferred for him to be with the team. But for his shortened regular season, Mashburn averaged about 21.5 points, 6 rebounds, and 4.5 and assists per game. The Hornets had relocated to New Orleans, and Mashburn returned healthy for the 03 season, as he played in all 82 games for the first and only time in his career. The trio again played well, averaging over 55 points combined, but Baron Davis would miss 32 games this season. Mashburn's great season would earn him recognition that he had never gotten before, as he was voted to his first and only All-Star team, and also made the All-NBA third team. The Hornets finished the season 47-35 and, and would face the Sixers in the first round. The series would go six games, but would see the Hornets lose to Philly, as after dropping the first two games, the Hornets would go 1-1 one one in games 3-4, and four, which Mashburn would miss due to a finger injury. And even though he came back strong for games 5 and 6, his 36 points in game 6 wasn't enough to stave off elimination. And for the regular season, Mashburn would average about 21.5 points, 6 rebounds, and a career-high 5.6 assists per game. He would also tie his career high when he scored 50 versus Memphis on February 21st. Mashburn was plagued by knee injuries from the beginning of the 04 season, and due to a November knee surgery, wouldn't see his first action until January 28th, and only played 19 games before being shut down for the rest of the season in early March due to knee discomfort, which also kept him out of the playoffs for a 41-41 Hornets team that lost to Miami in the first round. Mashburn's abbreviated season show that he was still extremely capable, as he averaged about 21 points, 6 rebounds, and 2.5 and assists per game. Mashburn opted to sit out of the 2005 season in hopes of recovering and returning to play in 2006. He would be traded to the Sixers for Glenn Robinson at the 05 trade deadline, but after remaining inactive through the 06 season, the Sixers waived Mashburn on March 24, 2006, where he would subsequently announce his retirement at just 33 years old, with his last NBA game being played at just 31 years old. So this would be a great career ended too soon. Jamal Mashburn came into the league with through the roof potential and seemed to be heading in that direction until he started to deal with injuries and clashing egos drove apart what could have been one of the great teams in Dallas. He found a role in Miami, but injuries plagued him and he just couldn't seem to get over the playoff hump. But once he was sent to Charlotte, he really showed his full ability as a player and gave us some of the smoothest basketball you could find during the early 2000s. And even with his physical decline, Jamal Mashburn's game aged like fine wine, as he knew what to do to refine it and keep himself effective until the very end. And that's a skill in and of itself. But sometimes you wanted Mashburn to assert himself more. He seemed too timid at times, which was frustrating as you knew how capable he was. And unfortunately, this was just his nature, as even his high school coach would say he just didn't have it in him to take over. Mashburn didn't have a big personality and didn't really spend a lot of time on big market teams during his career. And even when he was in Miami, he was not the marquee guy like an Alonzo Mourning or Tim Hardaway. But a lack of ego and aversion to the spotlight 
often ends up being a big reason why some of these great players hear their name mentioned less and less as the years go on. But the players and coaches around the league knew that they had their hands full whenever Mashburn was on the schedule. But that's all for today's episode of Forgotten Player Profiles on Jamal Mashburn. Hope you enjoyed it, and remember to subscribe for plenty more videos like this one. If you like this one, check out this video on the player he was traded for in 2000, or this one on his very brief Dallas Mavericks teammate. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.